Authorized to the resolution will now say the point of the resolution. The United States federal government should make all public health vaccines mandatory. The B support is the framework policy net benefit is the best criteria for the debate as allows both teams access to predictable burdens and methods of refutation. Observation two is the background. The only argument here is that science against vaccines has been debunked. This has no causal link to autism. Moreover, that probably is not a reason not to give a child a vaccine anyway. Thus, the plan. The United States federal government, through an act of Congress signed by the president, will make all public health vaccines mandatory. The United States federal government through an act of Congress signed by the President will make all public health vaccines mandatory. Observation 3 is the solvency. The first argument here is that this is going to include influenza, pneumonia, hepatitis A and B, MRR, uh, sorry, MMR, and uh, chickenpox, shingles, tetanus, and International travel? Or, yeah, it's international travel. International travel. Don't know what that means, but that's what it is. Uh, the second argument under the solvency is that the government must pay and provide for this. As a result, they can use mechanisms established through the ACA to be able to distribute the public health that is going to be necessary to provide for this for all Americans. Advantage one, public health. They support the uniqueness of the first argument is the prevention of disease. The middle A is that there were 226,000 individuals hospitalized as a result of influenza last year because they didn't get the flu vaccine. The little B is that there were between 3,000 and 49,000 individuals who died from influenza every year. The little C argument is that invasive pneumococcal had 32,000 cases that led to 3,300 deaths. Thus, the B supports the link. The first argument is that the plan takes mandates all of the vaccines for the diseases listed above as well as others. The the second argument is that the government is going to be forced to provide this, to, for example, through the ACA so that individuals can have access to this. There aren't going to be any unfunded mandates here. We're going to make sure that all individuals get access to the vaccines that we're mandating. The C support of the impacts. The first argument is that of systemic debt. The little a is that people are kept from health care, or, or people uh, aren't getting the vaccines right now, that this is going to be resolved through the plan text, that we're going to make sure that all individuals have the necessary vaccines that are going to prevent against these diseases. The little b is that this is going to resolve the problems that these individuals are facing right now that particularly individuals at the periphery are less likely to get access to these vaccines as a result of the cost or a result of the time that it would otherwise take them to get access to this. But once it is mandated, there is a much higher propensity that these individuals are going to be vaccinated because it is going to be at a substantially lower cost of them. The second argument is that of poverty. The little a is that healthcare costs are forcing individuals to make choices right now. When an individual is forced to uh, go to a hospital, it is an exorbitant cost for, for an individual who doesn't have access to health insurance. This means that these individuals have to make choices between things like paying their hospital bills or buying food or paying for heat of their homes for the month. The little b is that this leads to uh, starvation or homelessness for these individuals when they can't afford to cover all of their bills. They are forced to make strategic choices that necessarily place them at serious disadvantages over the rest of the population when entering into the workforce. The little c is that as a result of this, these individuals become trapped and have no propensity to escape from poverty. That individuals in poverty have a low probability of being able to escape as a result of very simple structural things that most of us take for granted, like being able to shower before a job interview or having a place to store your clean dress clothes before going into a job interview means that these individuals necessarily get trapped here. The, uh, now on to advantage two. Corey, you have that? Yeah. Advantage two. Ruralism. Ruralism. The A supports the uniqueness. The first argument is that rural populations are ignored right now. The little A is that discourses in the United States focus on suburbs in the cities where there are larger populations. The little B is that there are still 59 million rural citizens in the United States. The second argument is that there is a higher likelihood of socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, of an individual being socioeconomically disadvantaged. The little A is that one-seventh of all rural individuals are below the poverty line. The little B is that this translates to 7.4 million rural people who are impoverished in the United States. The little C is that 459 Nine of the 500 poorest counties in the United States are rural. The third argument is that this is a uh, ruralism is a place-based discrimination that is not encompassed by any other critical theory like sexism, racism, or anything else. The little a is that the policy uh, consistently ignores the needs of rural individuals, where they use stereotypes to render these individuals powerless and disenfranchised. We just picture rural farmers, not with the actual reality of the way that these individuals are living. The little b is that they are far from healthcare providers. Right, that means that they have a decrease ability to access things like vaccines, so simple diseases have the ability to spread through rural communities particularly quickly where it is less likely that there are going to be health care that will be deployed to these regions because there aren't rural health clinics available to many of these individuals. The piece of point is the link. The first argument is that the plant text signals a... a, a um, 
The plant text signals a unique uh, respect for the problems that are specific to the locations of these individuals and a recognition of their place-specific problems. The second argument is that we recognize the problems with access to healthcare specifically, which is their place-specific issue. And the third argument is that federal policy is key, that uh, without the rural populations are going to continue to languish, languish in invisibility, that without recognizing the fact that federal policy routinely ignores the needs of rural individuals, there is no propensity for that to change. Thus, the is the point of the impacts. The the first argument is that the AFT constructs the difference and brings the rural populations in from the periphery by um, by the shift of the, uh, the provided focus that is going to allow for these individuals to move from the periphery back to the center by recognizing their place specific issues. The little a is that this uh, the, we break down the false construction as the opposite of that the rural is the opposite of cities. The consistent stereotype is that the rural is the opposite of the urban. That if the city is dirty, then the rural is necessarily clean, and that if the city is bustling and busy, then the rural is necessarily peaceful, but these dichotomies are all often false and do fail to capture the dailiness of these individuals. The little b is that otherization results from this because the rural is viewed as wholly different from that of the urban or of the, uh, of the suburban, and this or this leads to an urban abuse of rural populations with things like uh, production and manufacturing, which more frequently happens in rural areas, or the disposal of toxic waste or of garbage in rural areas where the rural is expected to foot the cost of living of the urban while not reaping any of the benefits that the urban accesses. The little c here is that this is the logic of genocide because it renders these populations disposable. Their lack of access is blamed on them not, uh, and their specific choice of location not on structural things like uh, what it would otherwise be in the city. And the little d is that this leads to no value of life where they bear the weight of the behavior of the urban while not getting access to the benefits. The second argument is that of health security, that the, the diseases are able to spread faster there than the re because they don't have the resources to respond or the ability to mobilize resources to their specific areas where the CDC would be very quickly able to respond to a city. It is much more difficult and unlikely that the CDC would respond to a rural population experiencing an outbreak. It means that outbreaks in these areas are oftentimes untreated before too many people have fallen sick or died as a result and thus fallen into poverty or death. Sometimes fatal side effects from these uh, pharmaceuticals. 
from these uh, vaccines. Secondarily, is that uh, there's a lot of harmful ingredients included in these vaccines, such as chemicals, such as poisons, things of that nature. Uh, number three is that there's no checkbacks to make sure it is safe. So basically, these pharmaceutical companies are going out and making these vaccines and then telling you later that, oh, sorry, we screwed up. That vaccine is now giving you cancer or giving you, you know, some sort of uh, ailment that was not going to happen if you had not taken that uh, vaccine. So, uh, yeah, back in here is that from, 18, from 1989 to 2014, uh, Big Pharma got about uh, $2.7 billion in compensation for uh, making these vaccines. So basically, you can see that this is a company trying to make a profit. They're not uh, necessarily caring about how safe these vaccines are and how effective they will be. Actually, they'll make more money if they're ineffective because you've got to get another vaccine for another thing. Uh, secondarily, uh, the Gov says that these are not linked to autism, but it has been shown that the aluminum in some of these vaccines has been linked to uh, autism in some cases. So the fact of the matter is this still can have an impact on your children. Uh, number three for the backing is that about one, uh, one person per million has a uh, severe, severe allergic reaction to these vaccines, meaning that now you're giving someone something that they're, they're allergic to, meaning that they are you know have to go and get their stomach pumped, have to go get uh, this injection somehow out of their body to stop the harming them. All right, so uh, impacts here, we can see that uh, a cardiac impairment is involved with these uh, vaccines. So we can have, you know, basically death uh, resulting from that. Secondarily, respiratory issues, such as, I'll get you about time, man. I got a lot of stuff to go through. Uh, number three is the death disorder in children. Basically, so uh, we don't have a like vaccine limit on children, so we can get, uh, get children get these vaccines when they're very young, meaning that they develop these illnesses like right away when they're young. And as you know, your immune system isn't really that great when you're uh, super young and you're just growing, so that has a very serious effect on them. For example, uh, number four is the rotavirus vaccine. It uh, caused like half uh, blocking for uh, the digestion. So these people that got this virus, they had half of their digestion was blocked. So basically their health was hindered directly as a result of this vaccine. And number five is that uh, seizures and permanent brain damage also can result in these vaccines. So the fact of the matter is that it's a temporary solution, but it becomes a permanent problem. You try to give someone a vaccine to cure uh, measles or mumps or whatever, and they can end up with a permanent effect that is brain damage or something worse. Um, yes, number six is that, oh uh, yeah, there's a vaccine, uh, Lyme bricks, that's currently in a class action uh, lawsuit for destroying uh, immune systems. So we can see that this vaccine is actually completely destroying people's immune systems. This, uh, it's called Vitarix, and uh, that is uniquely, it's a, uh, uniquely bad to getting vaccines and having them mandatory. All right, so, uh, uh, like I said, I reached enough time, and I got still all along this to go. All right, uh, and then number three is gonna be corruption. Uh, the link here is that big pharma uh, lobbyists are basically pushing for the destruction of religious freedoms when it comes to people being able to uh, access, uh, not you know, decline vaccines, and they're also trying to push the 18 states which allow people to decline based on their own personal philosophy. They're trying to make it so those states make it so you have to get vaccines as well. So you can see that the, the basis of, their, of this argument is that big pharma wants to make more money off of sick people, like they've been doing forever and ever, uh, actually since about 18... 79, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the back for this is that you know they would have a huge, huge propensity to uh, gain this profit here because they have, you know, they're making it mandatory and they are the ones selling it, so you're gonna have to go to them to get your uh, vaccines. Secondarily, uh, since they're trying to make uh, profit off of this, they put the cheapest things that they possibly can in there. That's where you get the harmful chemicals that are going in your vaccines because they're trying to make these vaccines for as cheap as they possibly can in order to make the most amount of money off of the sick people. And, um, Back in number three is this leads to disease mongering. Disease mongering is basically a practice that states that uh, uh, you know, they basically create a disease after they have developed some sort of medication. The first example of this is back in 1879 with something you may be very familiar with. It's probably in your bathroom shelf. It's called Listerine. When they <coughs> was invented, which as we know, uh, you know, it's for fresh breath and killing germs. When Listerine was invented, they actually uh, made a disease around the fact that they were trying to sell this product that would kill germs in your mouth, and they called it halitosis. So they actually made up this disease in order to sell this green and gain more profit. So the impact here is basically that you know we have these uh, big pharma companies that are trying to push this on you only so they can get more money in their own pocket, and they don't actually care about you. And since they're trying to get more profit, they're putting those dangerous chemicals into the vaccines, which is causing you to get sick. All right, now on to on case. Okay, so um, on on case, 
Number one, they make a mistake that uh, the rule population is ignored. Oh wait, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, they're saying that. Um, and that's number two, actually. They're saying that this rural uh, policy is basically being ignored. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you look at the plan text, it says the United States federal government, through an act of Congress, will make all public man uh, mandatory. It doesn't say anything about setting up, you know, uh, vaccine areas in these rural areas, that sh which they mentioned are away from any sort of vaccine that they could get. So they're not going to garner any of their impacts from this, simply because they're not setting up some sort of uh, place where these people can actually go and get vaccines. It's not being... Um, you know, mentioned in their plan. They're only stating that these people have to go get the vaccines, which means these people in the rural areas now have to take time out of their day to go down to the city as opposed to, you know, having the vaccine right for them. And then, yeah, as far as uh, advantage one, or, yeah, as far as uh, advantage one still, uh, I'd say it's basically that this leads to poverty and all those sorts of things. And at least in depth, you can cross apply this to you know the class action lawsuits that are currently being held against big uh, pharmaceutical companies for uh, Ritorix or Ritorix, I should say, which is you know basically destroying the immune systems of these people. And um, also, yeah, look to the fact that their plan text does not solve for the harms that they're presenting. These people in the rural areas that aren't vaccinated that are dying, uh, they're not going to do anything to help them. They're just basically going to make it mandatory, which is going to make it worse for them. So they're going to have to spend their time and money to go out of their way to get these vaccinations. We're going to do case on top. We're going to go our solvency, advantage one, then advantage two. And then it'll go the religion disadvantage, the health disadvantage, the corruption disadvantage. Sorry, can I get that one more time? Certainly, the case starting at solvency, then advantage one, then advantage two. And that will be the religion disadvantage, the health disadvantage, the corruption disadvantage. So case and then all more. Right, Is everybody ready? The only thing I want you to extend on the solvency is the numbers who are well actually a couple of things. First, I want you to extend the argument that the argument that this is the, the number of the, sorry, the list of diseases that are actually affected there. This is going to be particularly important on there, or on the corruption disadvantage where they said that without that the big pharma just makes up diseases. These are the only diseases that are going to be affected by the plant text, which means that none of your arguments about disease monitoring are true when we are affecting these particular diseases which have been shown to have negative effects and have been shown to kill so kill thousands of individuals. This means that all of your means the entirety of the corruption disadvantage is not true. Additionally, the second argument argument I want you to look to here is the argument that says that the government that when the government makes it mandatory, it means the government has to pay for it. This means that all of your argument all of your argumentation on advantage two, where uh, about how, they, how we're not going to be setting it up, just not true. When the government has to make it makes it mandatory, it means that this is going to be provided, provided to all individuals across the United States, because it all means that we still have solvency for all both of our advantages. Advantage one. The only argument you make here is that the disadvantage term, in terms of case, we'll answer this more specifically there, but I want you to look sit across the uniqueness arguments to say that there are preventable diseases that are killing people in this status quo. There are 226,000 individuals that were, have been hospitalized from influenza and three to 49,000 people die a year as a result of influenza so and all sorts of other different diseases that Jacob reads out of the PMC. I want you to extend these. These will become very important on the rest of the, on the rest of the debate because our argument here is that when people are dying in the status quo from preventable diseases, we should not be looking at junk science to, 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 explain, it, to explain away the to explain away reasons why we shouldn't. These, all of the arguments that they are making through the through the case debate are not true and should always be preferring the number of deaths that have died and the highly probable impacts that have, that have come as a result. I want you to extend across specifically that when these preventable diseases affect people, it's not just those individuals that die, it's also the ones that are, they are, that are hospitalized for a long period of time and forces them into poverty as a result of their health care bills. This will be extended for looks at the specific impact that we give, that we give you out of the PMC uh, about how this affects them. This is a form of structural violence and individuals are forced to appropriate. Thank you. The only argument they make here is that the plan doesn't set up the vaccines in rural areas. We already answered this on the solvency debate. That by the government making it mandatory, it means that it has to be provided to all individuals. It means that this uh, means that we pay, means that we pay for it. If we provide it, it means that all of your argument means that this argumentation not only is not warranted, but also you can look to that we resolve that. Once you extend across all of the uh, the entirety of the advantage scenario that says that the rural populations are being excluded in the status quo and that this 
creating a form of place-based discrimination that not only leads to violence, but also leads to uh, the no value of life. All of this argumentation is going to become very important when they're trying to go for any kind of death or rights claims by saying that this form of discrimination not only is more probable, but also should be evaluated over uh, any over any of the impacts that, that they talk about. It means that you can extend across all of our impacts and uh, all the impacts that we talk about here. Jake, you can talk about that more in the game more. On the religious disadvantage. First argument I want here is the no link. That religious examples, uh, the really, really exemptions for religious for religious reasons are normal means. We say that this is that say that not only is it excluded for the entirety of the 18 states that have already resumed or opposed all this, but also federal policy on these forms of things. You can look to the Employment and Employment Discrimination Act as examples of how religious exam religious examples tend, tend to be included, which means they'll probably be exempted through the plan. Means there's no link to the disadvantage. But even if there were a link to the disadvantage that they could make, we say that they would say that uh, the turn that you should always be preferring the preferring the death of these individuals over their religious concerns. Our argument here is that when people are dying, especially those individuals that, especially children, the ones that are being forced not to have vaccines by their parents because of religious and religious reasons are the ones that are dying. We say that this is unique or because the government must resolve, you must resolve that uh, just because you had, uh, like, if you are an adult, you have a, uh, uh, an obligation, you have a right to say that you do not want yourself to be vaccinated or you do not want to be affected by a certain government policy, but your children, but the children have to be, uh, they have to be protected. That's the purpose of having government in order to protect individuals. It means that you should not be evaluating any of the plans that they are making on here. Additionally, they make arguments on the impact level about how, about how rights are steps on. We say that uh, you have to be alive in order to be in order to have those rights. We say that you should you should be prioritizing the loss of life, loss of life over, the, over these value-based based argumentation because of the fact that not only is it more probable because we actually can have a, uh, a, uh, a, death, a death count associated, we can actually have a tangible impact you can evaluate, but additionally we say that the, the, the loss of rights is seen uh, uh, across, uh, across all uh, across all the state. Like we can say that gun that you, your rights have been violated by things like gun control, but there's no tangible impact to that. We say that, that you should not be evaluating these, these forms of impacts. Additionally, they don't impact you. They don't give you any form of impact coming off of the loss of freedom. That is literally just, they say, these are the impact that freedoms are lost. There's no, they don't provide any reasons to why you should prefer that or, or why, that should, why that should come first. It means that, you should, means that this disadvantage is going to go away. On the health advantage, there's a couple of responses. First, that all of this is junk science. All of this has been disproven. They make argumentation uh, argumentation about the about the individuals that have uh, about autism. We say that not only first is that all of this has been this has been disproven over and over by multiple studies. In addition, second, the original individual who said who uh, who issued the study that's in the associated vaccines with autism not only retracted the study but additionally admitted that they handpicked they handpicked candidates that were that showed that showed signs of autism that in order to show a correlation. We say that all of this has been been disproven. Additionally, third, we can say that there have been multiple court cases that have said that all that there is no there is no correlation in the, between. Uh, Autism and the, and the usage of vaccines. vaccines means there's absolutely no internal links in there. There's no links to the story. Additionally, they make a bunch of generalized claims. They give you no specific warrants about the about the effects of these vaccines. They literally they literally just say that all of these have been shown. But they used to be preferring the actual effects of these present preventable diseases on individuals. Not able to out, middle that out way. But additionally, they the fact that vaccines have been shown to be safe uh, by by both the CDC and the FDA, uh, and the FDA as being effective. But additionally, you can look to the fact that we have a couple of more specific arguments. First, you say the FDA probably checks any effects, no, any harmful effects of vaccines. If there is a uh, strict regulatory process that all vaccines have to go through in order to be approved, means that it means that uh, even if there is a small correlation, it's often based on junk science. But just can say that the courts will probably will also check any check any abuse. Uh, you can look at the fact the court that the courts have gone through in order to be able to uh, people can bring court cases against big pharma companies in order to prevent in order to uh, if there is any problem, not only will they get the settlements, but also prevent any harmful effects in the future. You can extend their example about the class action lawsuit. You can extend their example about the class action lawsuit here that said that this that this caused the vaccine to be pulled off the market, which means that this is a prevent harm in the future. Additionally, the next round is going to be turned. The federal regulations also have created more focus and research into the industry that by the federal by the federal government saying that we uh, value when we value vaccines, we need to make sure that they're safe. It's going to allow not only for the FDA to provide more to provide more uh, focus and research, but also it's going to uh, allow companies more uh, more access in order to be able to have to develop better vaccines. This is going to mean that all of the health effects that you talk about are resolved. Good. On the corruption disadvantage, a couple of arguments. First is that this is just not true. There's no link to this. So you can, uh, if you look at the fact that big pharma, if they, if they were trying to just make money off of this, then they would probably make more money from the antibiotics and the treatment.
treatment process that is associated with individuals being hospitalized for preventable diseases. You can look to the fact that not only would Big Pharma make a lot of money off of the uh, actual hospital bills, but it also uh, off of the provision of provision of treatment of uh, treatment options. It means that it, it means that this is just empirically not proven. But additionally, the second argument here is that there's no links. That vaccines are a one-time thing. That you don't make you don't make consistent amount of amounts of money off of well, like uh, AIDS or HIV HIV medication, which is why that's so expensive. But rather, vaccines are not something that Big Pharma rather focuses on. This is why the government needs to provide the amount of money that's necessary in order to be able to afford to to allow for it to be provided to all individuals. Additionally, the next argument is the term the federal regulations probably solve that uh, Big Pharma is, is uh, Big Pharma is able to take advantage of individuals within the current market because of the fact that there are no regulations means that only by creating regulations and creating focus within the vaccine industry are we able to resolve a lot of the, a lot of the corruption that's associated with. Additionally, you say that the, the, you say that the FDA that they make up that they make up diseases. The real science is the only science we care about. You should look to the fact that we provide a specific list of the vaccines that are provided that is going to that that means that you can't just make up the diseases that will have a public health vaccine. It's not how the system works. Did you say that you don't provide the impact of the story? There's no reason to why the corruption of Big Pharma will be problematic at the end of the day. We will always prefer the impact of giving you off the, off the affirmative. Especially when 
If you cross apply the disadvantage, you provide you of health, and more health complications can be ensued and have happened frequently thanks to these vaccines actually being used. There have been serious complications, which I will further elaborate, but just cross apply the analysis we give you on the disadvantage. At the point that these people have to take time out of work to go in, you have these vaccines that are not proven to be effective and also can have health complications because of it, you will see that this is actually turn going to further push them into cyclical poverty. Because even if they only have to go on one time, if there's the chance that these people are going to have further health complications because of this, you're going to see no real net benefit in the end, and these people are only going to be worse off. With that, it's going to advantage grow. Now, flow across grads no meat argument, the, all, the only thing they try to say is, oh, well, actually, the government is providing this. Once again, this is a moving target and uniquely abusive to us. During the first weeks, they say the government is paying for this. The second, they say the government is providing it. They are not going to have bands of people driving out to these rural citizens' houses and being like, oh, hey, we brought you some vaccines. No, these people are going to have to travel into town, which is still just as difficult, and you still see all of these impacts that they are having because there are still going to be these individuals who might not be able to make it in or are going to have to drive that far, take time off. We are still going to see all of these issues. There is no link to the impact that they try to garner here. So they are going to have to spend time and money. And once again, falsify my analysis from the poverty disadvantage here. If these individuals do get sick, that's going to harm them a lot more. Living on a farm and working on a farm requires a lot of work. Sick days for them cost a lot more because they cannot go out and feed the animals and or till the fields and or do all the things that are required on daily life on a farm. With that, you can see they don't have, no longer have any access to their advantages, and let's go obvious. Starting on this is what one for religious reasons. The only thing they say here is no link to the normal means. However, their plan does not specify that they are going to have any sort of functions to adjust for um, religion. The plan text specifically says, the United States federal government, through an act of Congress signed by the president, will make all public health vaccines mandatory. There is no sort of stipulations, no sort of uh, exceptions. That is the plan that they write. If they wanted to have exceptions, they should have read that in their plan text. That is not what their plan does. There are no sort of stipulations here. So, do not assume normal means for them. Their plan itself, when they read it, said that they were not making any sort of special privileges for individuals with religion. So you can see all of this is still going to flow across. They also try and bring up a term here saying it's preferable to keep these people from dying. Cross apply my analysis on the fact that not only are these vaccines not proven to 100% solve, they are also proven to cause harms and damages to these individuals. So not only are you putting their lives at risk, but you are also stepping on their religion, which fundamentally goes against the First Amendment and the rights of the people. That is something that is very big in America, and they're not going to be happy with that. They also say that children must be but protected, but under status quo, children do have to get the vaccines if they go to public schools, that's simply how it is. Adults have their own choices, but they are demolishing all of those rights, not just for children, but for adults as well. And you can see that's not going to be beneficial in the end. So there's no turn here. This is going to lead to individuals being extremely upset. There's going to be a domino effect where other individuals' religious rights are just stepped on and squashed. So you can see the impact here is that this would be a domino effect. This is going to decrease people's religious freedom and overall lead to lead to a backlash from these people because they don't want to see that happening. With that, let's go on to disadvantage two, which is your biggest voting issue here. At the point where these vaccines they are trying to say are beneficial, they say this is show that they cause harms. There's no reason to vote for the plan. They say it's all junk science. However, they only give the example of autism. Fine, throw the example of autism out the window. We can still look to the one per million people who have extreme adverse reactions to these allergic, to these vaccinations. You can look to um, Lutolrine. It's a vaccination allergy that cause respiratory issues. You can look to formaldehyde, which is used in a lot of vaccination, which causes cardiac impairments and oftentimes death. You can look to rhinovirus vaccine, which is, causes the blockage of the digestive system. You can look to DTaP, which causes seizures, permanent brain damage. And the CDC estimates that there are over 30,000 serious adverse reactions and fatalities due to these vaccines per year. This turn does not stand at the point where we give you plenty of warrants showing that these vaccines have proven to adversely affect the health of a majority of people. Also, they see CDC and FDA approved. However, the FDA has had many recalls throughout its years, and the courts are not going to 100% resolve this as they say. Look to all the examples of the pullbacks we've had so far. On to the third disadvantage. Um, once again, no turn here. This plan, their plan does not make any sort of regulations. They did not stipulate that. Um, 
We see currently in status quo that there are issues with these vaccines and they have been proven to cause harm. So when you look big picture today, you do not vote on the chance of helping a few people that aren't flushed out when it comes to the harm and disadvantage of the majority of people in America. Everyone's cool with it. I'm going to go that Thank you. Yes. That would be very cool with that. I would be afraid for them. It's like a little but bit. But I would like a video of that. Alright, are we ready? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, once again, just a quick thank you to everyone for showing up. Thank you for making it to this debate and much respect. Alright, so I'm just gonna basically do uh, an overview and then two worlds. So uh, I think going on on case you can see that uh, as my partner just pointed out, these people would still be needing the time and money, and they do not point out any sort of, uh, they may still need to just go to travel to these places to get vaccines, and they won't be having any sort of, you know, government going to them to uh, give them these vaccines. They only stated that they're going to pay for these vaccines, and you will only listen to what their plan text stated in the PMC. You will not allow them to adjust to their moving target back like they had, where they said that they would be providing these instead of just paying them. So you can see that through advantage, uh, number I think it was two, well, about the rural areas, that these people will still not be having access to vaccines because they won't be able to lead and actually go pick these things up, which will be just making their property even worse. And then, um, yeah, furthermore, uh, just go to off case real fast. It's, or, uh, let's actually, let's go to solve this real fast. Uh, we can see that, you know, we're basically weighing having people's religious rights stepped on versus, you know, having uh, a few people, you know, not be given these vaccines, which can be harmful in the longer. So we see that not only is their plan pushing uh, a harmful, possibly harmful substance onto you, and also uh, helping big pharma become even more powerful in our society, which it already has a lot of power, then we can, uh, they're also not going to solve for, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway. So yeah, they have no solvency because you know these uh, vaccines do have danger, and they cannot just go out and uh, destroy the First Amendment and say that oh yeah, you don't have freedom of religion anymore. You can't uh, do this because of religious belief. You have to actually now take this vaccine, even though it is against your beliefs. And that people are going to backlash just from that right there. And uh, the fact of the matter is, they're trying to destroy someone's constitutional rights in order to possibly kill them by giving them a vaccine which may or may not be. Uh, very good. And furthermore, as my partner states out, uh, they do state that these uh, are controlled by the CDC and the FDA. However, the FDA has recalled thousands and thousands of drugs, as you may know if you watch TV late at night and know someone infected by mesothelioma or anything like that. You can see that there are drugs used to treat these things, and the FDA actually goes and has to recall them, and there are lawsuits that are brought up because the, uh, it's not done effectively. And then furthermore, you can see that all of our um, off-case positions still uh, flow through, even though they were uh, tried, they did try to turn them. We can see that uh, the freedom of religion, we can, you know, they, these people have their First Amendment rights here, so that is protecting them from this plan even happening. In order for this plan to pass, we would have to do something that, you know, would defy what we've ever done, and do something against the First Amendment, which is just uh, prior to this. And uh, moving on to this bench too, uh, you know, basically, we can see that there are one per million of these people who get severe religious reactions and lose their immune system in its entire in its entirety. So the fact is now they are susceptible to every kind of disease, pretty much ever, because they have no immune system. And you know the one per million of these is actually getting a serious allergic reaction, which can cause death if um, not looked at. And lastly, one of the biggest things we're going to be considering today is the corruption of big pharma. Uh, the fact of the matter is that big pharmaceutical makes money off of these sick people, so they can basically put the lowest uh, quality and the cheapest things that they can into these vaccines in order to make them the most amount of money. And, you know, basically, uh, when it gets turned around, there's a lot of people that die from these uh, vaccines and these things, like as they uh, have always stated, and they only get sued. These people lose their family members, and all they get is a small chunk of money to make up for a dead guy that wouldn't have been dead if he hadn't have gone and gotten this vaccine. So, vote for us. If you want. <laughs> we'll have an overview at the top, followed by our solvency. 
then the disadvantages in order, that's religion, health, and corruption, and then advantage one is on the bottom. ballot for Nevada CM today. The solvency story has been consistent since the PMC. I originally said that the government would both pay and provide for health care or for immunizations for these individuals. Moreover, these disadvantages without impacts are never going to be able to weigh against the impacts of the affirmative it means that when we still have access to that link story, then we are going to be winning the debate today because all of their impacts are going to be outweighed by the poverty described in advantage one and by the lack of value of life created under advantage two. Thus, on the solvency. The only argument that I want here is where they say that we made a shift from the government is just paying for it to the government is providing it. The very the specific warrant, it's even what I have written on my flow right here, is that the government must pay for and provide through, for example, pre-existing mechanisms like the Affordable Care Act. That's as close as word to word as I can get for what I said. This is not a shift. We've been reading this since the PMC. Are you happy there? Yeah. You can cross-apply this to every spot where the solvency has been put in question, either on the disadvantages or on the advantages. It will become particularly important on the advantage flows. On the disadvantage one religion. There are four arguments that I want here. The first argument that you can extend is that exemptions as normal means that there are already 18 states who have resolved questions like this, and that uh, these states are already, you know, the federal government already has routine exemptions for religious purposes. This means that there is no propensity for this to happen. But the next argument that you can extend is Corey's framing argument about how you need to prefer issues of death before issues of rights, that you can't have rights if you're dead already, so that you need to be preferring this person. When this goes unresponded to, you're going to be extending that. But the next argument that I want you to look to is the no impacts argument that Corey extends. The only impact that comes out of here is that this leads to a domino effect, but there's no terminalized impact here. We don't know what a domino effect means contextually in the round, so you're always going to be referring issues of no value to life and no issues of poverty before this. Happy there, Corey? Uh, yes. Yes. Health. Just that on health. A couple of responses that I want to make here. The first argument that I want to look to is where they say that one in one million people will have severe allergic reactions. Their only explanation of this is that these individuals are going to be hospitalized as a result. First of all, hospitalization is not unique. You can look to the, the uniqueness story that is read on Advantage 1 that there are already 226,000 individuals who are hospitalized for the flu every year. So hospitalization is already happening in the status quo. There's no propensity for this to get any worse. However, you can uh, also look to, you need to weigh the impacts of Advantage 1 against this hospitalization of one in one million people. The propensity for this is such a low probability that you're going to be preferring the probability of the affirmative uh, rather than this disadvantage. This really is just another parallel link story on Advantage 1 that is attempting to function as a link term because it's going for the same impact scenario. However, you are going to be preferring the scenario that comes out of Advantage 1 because our magnitude is so much larger before the number of people that we're able to help as a result of our plan. Are you happy with that? Extend the term regulations means more research. Right, you can also extend for his turn that regulation is going to lead to more research, which is going to be able to check this back. Moreover, when they don't have some back that the FDA is going to check and that courts are also able to check, then there's no propensity for this to be able to outweigh the affirmative case. Third dissent, corruption. I want three extensions here. The first is that federal regulations are going to solve, that the federal government isn't going to allow them to push phony drugs. The next is that you can, the, is the argument that Corey makes that you can use our list. Well, they say this is going to lead to disease mongering. We are only using what is described in the solvency on the PMC, means there's no propensity for that. But the next, last argument you can extend is that there's no impact here. The only impact that they have is it makes some people sick. However, this is going to be outweighed when they don't quantify how many people are sick right now, or uh, how many more people are going to be getting sick. You're going to prefer the number of people that we prevent from getting sick under Advantage 1. We have quantified impacts that need to be looking there first on Advantage 1. Two responses that they make. Not all diseases can be prevented through vaccines. Um, this might deal with some of the risk of our link story, but not very much. You're going to be preferring our link story when they don't give you specifics here, and we tell you how many individuals are going to be able to uh, be solved for out of the PMC. But the next argument that they make is that uh, this is making people spend their time and money. There are three responses here. The first is that this is uh, that first we are preventing poverty, that these individuals are uh, going to uh, not be forced into poverty as a result of not having these high health bills. But the second is that the unemployed probably have time to go to health centers right now because they're not working, means that they're 
there are fewer obligations on the time. The third argument is that immunizations uh, happen not only at hospitals, that individuals can go to health centers that are close to their work is probably going to be able to solve that for this. Advantage two, ruralism. Uh, the argument that they make about how this is a moving target, this isn't a moving target. The BMC has stayed with this advocacy uh, from the very beginning. That, uh, moreover, we are still able to solve specifically for this advantage to the perception shift. That is the specific link story. It means that we still get access to our no value for life claims in here, which is going to be the largest magnitude impact in the debate and needs to be evaluated first. The only other argument that they make is about sick days being costly. You can cross apply my applications from advantage one. The affirmative team has solved for the largest impacts on the ground and deserves a win as a result. came down to a lot of drop turns from the MO, that the disadvantages had turns on them, especially you're not responding to the FT solves, um, which I don't think is a very good turn, but the turn nonetheless, I think it's more of a no link than it is of the turn on the disadvantage. But, uh, the other thing is, is you're, you are not listening to their solvency, so your uniqueness is just not true. Um, it's not happening. Uh, you need to be putting more ink on the advantages. Even if we grant you access to the one in a million, 999,999 people obviously outweigh one in a million, right? So you're just not, you need more warrants or you need to do something more to prove that why that one in a million impacts out greater than, uh, than what's coming from the informative team. Also, in the LOR, you need to be doing more impact calculus. You're not out, you're not weighing out any of the impacts, especially when the affirmative team has the same is have, is keeping the same pattern of how they are outweighing on impact level. You have none of that coming out of the LOR, so you're not isolating or sending anything. You're just trying to go for everything. So there's really no um, rebuttal strategy of what the office is coming for, and there's a clear strategy of what the PMR is sitting on as far as money. So it's a pretty easy vote for the affirmative side. Um, I thought it was very difficult to be on that for this resolution. So we're just doing pretty good. Thank you. Okay, I can't do this. Can you turn it off? Yes.